Hello, everybody. Welcome to the March edition of the Wellness Policy. My name is Wei Ting. Happy to be back here. A full month, and what a month it's been. Uh, joined, as always, by my good friends. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> That's a bad omen. I, I'm i sorry. I was on such a good streak. Um, making sure that that was off. Apologies, everybody. Let's start this again. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm here with my good friends, Jordan Goodman and Neil Flanagan. How are you two this month? Hello, Neil. Um, uh, I'll, I'll start off by saying there was a, a, a horrific, terrible tragedy in Baltimore uh, early this morning. A major bridge collapsed. Uh, it's fucking terrible. A, a ship lost power and just plowed into it um there are many people unaccounted for in the water um wow. so before we get into this uh just much love uh to the city and uh surrounding counties of baltimore very sorry yeah, to hear that it's wow. absolutely horrific scene it's made headlines all over the world jordan it's the first it's the top story on the bbc i assume because of the incredible visual but of course the main thing is these unaccounted for people it's um Terrible tragedy. Mm, yeah, I've, uh, uh, I guess not surprised in in how the story has spread. I've had multiple friends reach out from various countries uh, uh, first thing this morning to just check in and 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 see how I was doing. That's very appreciative. Uh, and as I think about it, the most of the people that reached out are part of this pro wrestling community. Um, as is our guest today, a good friend of mine, Nick Shiner. Um, and it just, I, I guess, further uh helps me appreciate the 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 benefits of this community in pro wrestling that um even as something as awful as a very localized story to where i live uh i have a global community um of friends through wrestling that are paying attention and reach out to uh to to show concern and i think that um is a bright spot in in a really dark day at least here in Baltimore. Um, so with that said, not the, the most light and cheerful start to the wellness policy, um, but but we have a friend, as, as I mentioned, uh, he is full of light. Uh, he is perhaps- He's in Baltimore. I don't know. He is in Baltimore, in um, Baltimore. And he said he's here for the vibes. Uh, I'm not sure what that means, but we will find out. Uh, he, he he comes live from, I, I believe, his, his, his home with, with a, a Yoda, a Mario, uh, some wrestling figures even. He is a wrestling fan, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Uh, who, who would this be? Ric Flair. Maybe it's not the, the, the best to, to lead with, Nick. Um, but a, a, a woo indeed. Uh, Biggie, a much mm. better candidate to show live um, on the internet. Uh, Nick, Nick, welcome Thank to you. the Wellness Policy. Hi, Ray Ray. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, it's, you know... It, it, your comments about global community and the, those being the ones who check in, you know, I think I, I don't live super close to where the where the key bridge is, but I live close enough. But I had folks check in from Canada and Hong Kong before folks a state or two over just because it, this is it's global news, um, obviously, for the loss of life. Uh, but then you think about the longer term implications of like it's the only way in and out of the port of Baltimore. Uh, that's completely shut off right now. But we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about, like you said, light, life, um, and we'll, we're going to try and stick that. So I really appreciate you all having me today. Yeah, man, it's good to have you, bud. Um, so your your thing is video games, at least when when I think of you, from a professional context at least. Um, but also, this is a big part of just who you are, what you're into. So that that is the more general topic today on this episode of the wellness policy, um, but Nick, you just have a very interesting story and and career trajectory in that you have really made gaming a centerpiece of of your work, your mission, and and your your, your professional life. Um, I guess I'd be curious, maybe just as a way to start the show maybe kind of a, a relatively brief round table of maybe all of our connections to video games. And then I know a lot of the richness that you'll bring to the conversation today, Nick, is perhaps helping us think about gaming in ways that many of us maybe 
don't consider as it relates to um, education, at least yeah. most primarily. Absolutely. Um, I love that. But, but Wei, let's start with you. Let's start with you, Wei. Mm -hmm. uh, Wei. Yeah. You, My you, history? A gamer? you a gamer? Um, I would not classify myself as, as a gamer um, in the classical sense, I suppose. Um, I started playing video games, I would say, probably... Um, like my first system, I think was like 1991, probably the Super Nintendo, and um, probably like was a pretty consistent, you know, I, like obsessive, you know, in that whole scene throughout the the course of that, um, uh, I guess platform. And then my brother got a PlayStation, so I kind of um, switched sides, and I would say maybe graduated to the next generation through that. And that carried me through, I would say, all the way until like 2002, you know, when the PS2, uh, around the time the PS2, I guess, was really taken off. And I never really kind of made the jump. Um, so I would say like I had a good decade there where I was like really, really obsessive with video games, but I never really kind of progressed beyond that other than like occasionally jumping in for... I don't know, like um, uh, like a, a brief sort of period. Um, I think I had started to, at that point, realize um well i i had other interests and um i also realized um how obsessive i get with video games and i recognized just even for me physically it was not um it was something that was hot that was hard for me to control and therefore um i realized it was not necessarily having great effect on me um so maybe that's something I'd, I'd love to ask Nick about is, you know, how do you sort of self-regulate some with something that I think could be so time consuming and so physically consuming? But um, that's just sort of a brief history of, of my own uh, experience with video gaming. Was there a particular game that comes to mind that really captured your attention the most? Uh, I was like deep into Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. I was deep yeah. into the, the wrestling video games, um, in particular. Um, I, I mean, I was probably the one, of, one of the only people that would obsessively play um, Know Your Role SmackDown Two, because it was like the best game at the PlayStation at the time. I didn't have No Mercy. I didn't have an N sixty four. Um, so I would just like, it was, if you saw me work these matches, like I would. I would play AI, but I would like <laughs> wrestle them like they were actual like scripted matches. Like you you can kick out, right? You're yourself. So I would voluntarily kick out for near falls and I would try, try to build the climaxes and I just like create all these Japanese wrestlers. Anyway, it was like it was at a level where like I, um, I was spending a lot of time on, on it. Huh. So last month we talked about wrestling and our connections yeah. to wrestling this never came up and i it just dawned on me um we never talked about wrestling figures from memory so i'm wondering for you way when you were younger did you play with wrestling figures and did you engage with that level of detail like like toys you mean like yeah yeah, yeah 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 and um, and like kind of your own fiction but being mindful of like false finishes and stuff like that well i i would do that um not with the pro wrestling figures because like they just weren't worth that available where i lived or at least like i could never get the the wrestling figure i wanted you know where i lived and so i did that with my power rangers toys because there were several points of articulation and they're actually really great to like pose and, and put into like sharpshooters and things like that so i i would do that occasionally um yeah so that that thank you for unlocking that that core memory Thank you for sharing. Um, Neil, Hello. Are, are you a gamer? Not particularly, although I dabble still, but mostly in the more kind of basic gaming. I've got a Switch. I also have a PS5, but it's more or less an ornament these days. I bought it when I was uh, deep into the pandemic and they were very short on stock and they became available. And I thought, well, this is going to be a way for me to get back into gaming and um, perhaps... Um, just use up some of this free time that I've got while we're all in quarantine. Um, but I quickly realized I've never really made the jump correctly from um, three or four buttons and a controller to two controllers. One was is that kind of mechanic of one is for the camera, one is for movement. And I know I can get there if I really like apply myself. I drive a car with a gear shift, you know, so I'm, I'm used to sort of multitasking, but um, yeah, some of the next gen games look wonderful, but I'm terrible at them. I told this story before last month, so I won't 
get into it very far, but and uh, you know, I got one of the the top games for the PS5 came bundled with it, which is Miles Morales Spider Man, Spider Man, it's like a surname, Spider Man, yeah. <laughs> and um, that's a Friends reference, I think. But I couldn't get to the um, um, I couldn't get to the actual game because I couldn't get past the tutorial where you need to catch Rhino the villain because I just and I just rage quit several times. But if I can rewind a little bit, not to hog the conversation, I'm probably the oldest here. I'm pretty sure I am. I'm, I'm uh, Nick. You look very youthful, so I, I, I and I know the ages of the other two. So my first exposure to video games is Space Invaders. I mean, I go back that far. There was a old Space Invaders um, um, arcade game in the local uh, shopping mall where my mum used to take me, and then Pac Man, and then Bubble Bobble, and then you know going to the arcades and playing those sorts of games. Graduated from the NES to the SNES to the N64, um, PS1, skipped the PS2, got the PS3. Uh, and that's where I kind of was on a bit of a hiatus. I never really was able to kick Mario Kart, though. That is still just ever since uh, its first iteration, has I still play it to this day. And when they released all of the classic courses last year for the Switch, I was all oh, about yeah. that. Mm. So that's my history. Um, what a history, Neil! Riveting. Um, I'll, I'll, <laughs> nice. I'll, I'll share. I'll, I'll share briefly. Then I want to put the spotlight on our on our guest, Nick. Um, my first console was the the NES, um, and and I guess thinking back, I liked video games. I always did, and and I played it. I'd, I'd say relatively often, but. Even as I'm asking you guys, like, are you a gamer? Then I start thinking, well, what does that even mean? And mm -hmm. how do we choose to identify as such or not? And like thinking back, I never identified as a gamer. It wasn't certainly a part of my identity. It, I don't think it was ever like the thing that I was most drawn to. But throughout most of grade school, I played fairly often. I got the Super Nintendo after that. I um, And Nick would know, but maybe the Sega Genesis prior to that or probably around the same time uh i then we got what was it uh, the, not not nick you might have to help me out i don't know if it was sega it wasn't sega saturn Sega was, saturn came was i think after the genesis yeah and before the dreamcast I, I i think it was sega saturn it came with that that remember that aerosmith shooting game yes yeah, it, like it, I, I, I think it was the Sega Saturn. It came with three free games. I think that's what convinced us. And one of it, one of those was that Aerosmith game. Um, and then I, I think I briefly got a Nintendo sixty four years after it came out, only to play Pokemon Snap for like six months, and then sold everything. But like as, as Neil mentioned, when Nintendo sixty four came out, uh, like I, I played at friends' house. But I, I never had my own or really cared um, for the first few years. So with like now we're in a 3D atmosphere, we got the double joystick and, and one is to, for kind of the, the perspective. I never developed those skills. So like there were plenty of sleepovers where all the guys wanted to play Goldeneye. And I would just get taken out within seconds because I didn't have the skill set to navigate a game like that. I still don't. And I feel like that was maybe the key thing that just took me out of much of gaming for the rest of my life. I got a PS2. That's the last console I owned. Um, I threw it away recently. The DVD memento was stuck in it for about 15 years. Um, but that was like my first DVD player as well. And so it's kind of like Madden was my game for the most part. Uh, that's something I still can pick up and feel like I, I can hang. Um, but when I think of video games like now, you know, I just play some of these like the fucking puzzle games on my phone. And, and, and I guess, and as like that came to mind later as we discussed or decided on this topic. And then I wonder, uh, and Nick, maybe you could shine some light. Uh, when we think about being a gamer or playing games, like do most of us think of these mobile games? Or I, I don't know. I, I think it's just kind of like breaking down what we define. But like I play some of these mobile games daily and often, but yet I still don't think of myself as a gamer because it's not like console or PC. Um, so that's kind of my history. Um, Nick, we, we teed up a bunch. Feel yeah, free to well, I've been taking notes, so it's all good. Yeah. Um, 
like so let's start right there as far as i'm concerned anybody who plays games is a gamer right if you're if you read you're a reader if you watch tv you're a television watcher movie goer though like there is there's the act which is part of the definition but then there's also that subset which is like the archetype right like the the, the gamer archetype like i am somebody who considers myself to be a gamer and some of the characteristics that are in that stereotypical realm may or may not apply to me. I consider myself part of that community, really. And and I think you'd say the same for, for the other ones that I just mentioned, right? If you're a reader, like you may not be a reader that's a part of a community, but you also, you may use Goodreads to connect with other readers and find books. You may be in a book club and get together with friends to discuss the book. So like there are different levels of it, but I think when you talk about if you, if you play games, you are at the very least a game player. Yeah. Like, I mean, maybe you don't identify as a gamer and that's fine. But like, I would still consider you to be somebody who plays games. Uh, they're not they're not your AAA titles. They're not your uh, indie titles. But like you actively engage in elements of play and element and game elements. So by that definition, you are a gamer. Um, but th I mean, that 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 identity piece is is such a huge part of it because it's also used for good and bad, right? Like there are people who consider themselves gamers and they get together and they like PAX East was uh, just last weekend. That's in, I think it's in Boston, like a huge gaming and geek culture festival, um, lots of conference sessions and things like that. People get together and like, it's a great time. But then there's also the toxic side of gamer culture and the gaming community you talk about gamergate and and bad things happening in gaming conventions and toxicity online and and the the language that folks use and the and the uh just all the ways that gaming can be used for bad as well so it's it is very much a community and with that good and bad comes out of that and i think that for some folks, that's really attracting to them. They want to be part of this community. And for other folks, it's like, I don't want to be associated with that. I don't want to be called a gamer because I know how that word resonates in some circles. So it really, it's an interesting conversation that that actually comes up a lot. Is like how folks identify themselves as gamers and how we define it, which is why I always just go back to like, if you play games, you're a gamer. You may not be part of the gaming community and that's okay, um, but you are still by its very nature, someone who plays games, a gamer. Yeah. Um, if you could, Nick, just maybe a, a more of a formal introduction, like you to gaming, like w why gaming, how it has captured like your heart and imagination and attention throughout life. Um, and then more recently, like how this has become a focal point of, of your career and mission in life. Yeah, absolutely. So I've been... I've been a lifelong gamer and I've definitely gone through periods of time where like I didn't play as much way. I think you said like you, you got kind of that like PS2, P like there was a period of time where you're just like, okay, like this isn't really mm -hmm. like where my focus is. And I definitely had that as well. And then I would, it, it's honestly, it's, it's a very similar relationship that I've had with professional wrestling also like this, like I, I get very invested and then like, I'll like keep a pulse on it. You know, like I haven't watched Raw or Smack. We're in the WrestleMania build. I haven't watched a ton recently, but like, I'm pumped for the event. Like I'm going to re-engage then. And like, I'm still keeping up with it. But then there's been periods of time where like, I have no idea what's going on. Um, but I've been a lifelong gaming fan. Uh, my first console was the original Nintendo. I think I was about four. Um, one of my like earliest memories is like intentionally missing the duck in duck hunt because I thought it was <laughs> hilarious as a four year old that the kid, I'm um, sorry that, that I'd miss and that the dog would pop up and laugh in my face like i thought that was absolutely <laughs> hilarious um I, I loved super mario and then i had i'd say throughout the gen like i actually so i guess i went nintendo then like super nintendo and i got us it wasn't even the sega genesis at this point it was like this weird it was what was it it was like this it was like a mixture of the sega and sega cd um but it was this like handheld, like you could carry it with you and also use it as like. Is it uh, the, uh, the Lynx? Uh, here, I, um, can I share screen? I actually, I pulled it up. Let me see. Uh, if, if you, I, if you can't know. send me a link in the chat and I'll okay. put it up. Um, but I am, uh, it was the salt Sega, the Sega multi mega. Uh, I'm sending it to you. Sega multi mega. Okay. I brought it um, up. It's yeah. 
paste in there right now. But I've it, never it, heard it, of this. It what like, is this? It was wild. Um, and it was like later in the Sega Genesis, uh, Genesis, and it was also my disc man. Like my parents weren't gonna buy me this thing and a disc man. <laughs> so and it had no skip protection. It was an awful disc man. It took like six AA batteries, but it played Sega and Sega CD games. It was it was very cool. Um pain in the ass to use uh anytime i was in the car trying to listen to music um but i had this thing i always like i was always i think nintendo first and then like later in a console generation i'd get uh stuff on the sony side so like i went n64 and then i got a playstation playstation 2 um gamecube straight like gamecube didn't really do it for me i had that i might i think i've gotten a ps2 uh, before that but like again i've i've gamed my whole life grand theft auto 3 um was like majorly formative uh jordan you alluded to this like that was your first dvd player that console sold the way that it did because it was so many people's first dvd player you could go out and you could buy a dvd player that was only a dvd player for more money than it cost to buy the playstation 2 which is why so many people bought it and like why their adoption rates were through the roof so that was my first dvd player as well um and then i definitely played in, like going into college played uh had xbox at that point um finally played online for the first time halo the original halo um land party style in my dorm at towson university um before the like, land party you have to get together everybody's got their own tv and all their stuff because we were all on the same network we could have land parties from our dorm rooms so we would play with people that we didn't even know it was before they launched xbox live i didn't have a pc that could run any of those games uh that were that powerful so for me it was like this whole new world of like i can play games with other people in this in this building and then shortly after that halo 2 and xbox live really went crazy but um, in sorry in hindsight nick like i don't remember ever hanging with you at towson university we would have been going for uh, at the same time for most of the years. Uh, I should have invited you my first year in Tower A. I bought a, a DDR mat and game right. off oh, some, you're, you're some kid. And team. and like the DDR thing, we 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 went hard for maybe a good three weeks in Tower A. I should have invited you I over. Was in Tower, I was in Tower C, but not until my second year. Hmm. Um, but no, actually like DDR is, is actually one of the things that I like cite as one of the reasons why I'm like so passionate about games and living a playful life because yeah there it is um that's how i lost my freshman 50 um yeah no and i didn't i didn't misspeak there uh my freshman 50 um, yeah uh, yeah unlimited <laughs> unlimited access to all you can eat buffets right outside of your door um did a number on me but like i lost a ton of weight playing ddr because i got that like, dopamine hit from playing the game getting a better score um, and I played it regularly and we played it all the time. And like, I lost weight. I mean, I don't think it would work for me now. Metabolism, Neil, I appreciate the, the young, the young, uh, compliment looking youthful, uh, but I don't lose weight like I used to. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was, that was definitely a big one at that time. Um, well, so if I can interject, I mean, DDR was huge, huge. uh, really everywhere, but like, I think, uh, you know, among my, my friends in the sort of, um, Asian gaming community that were probably playing it even before it became like wildly popular, um, in Canada. So like, they would like have these, these parties and that, yeah, like getting one of these mats was a huge deal. And yeah. for me, I recognize it as like maybe one of the earliest times of like, um, video gaming, sort of changing from simply being sitting down this sort of sedentary thing with a video c controller to something that became far more active and at this point something that could actually increase physical activity mm -hmm. versus decrease yeah and you see a ton of the, you know on the switch they have ring fit so like it's got like the squeezable thing and you can do cardio with it you put the controllers on your legs obviously the entire generation of the wii had all the just dance games all of these games that promoted uh, physical well-being. We fit. It, I think it even had like a scale peripheral that you could use with it as well. So you see this like proliferation of games specifically for health and well-being, but then also taking elements of games and gamifying other things. There was a um an app I was using. God, it was right around when I probably like 2005, 2006. It was right right before I got married, and it was called Fitocracy, and it was like a gamified uh social networking slash fitness app and like you would get points for how many reps you did and like increasing weight and trying new exercises and like all of these different gamified elements 
and it helped like it helped a lot it was an incentive like oh you could like pick up like quest lines and say like i'm i'm on the back and biceps quest line this week and i'm doing these things to to and it actually had real physical tangible benefits uh for for my fitness routine again that goes by the wayside there's a lot of research that like gamification does yeah i don't even i don't even know if they like i know it's still there i don't know how it works now and certainly how they decided to start monetizing it but um gamification like has its benefits but it's really most of the time it's it's very it's that's very much like ex extrinsic motivation it's like oh this is fun for a while um and then you slowly start to lose that so if you haven't built the habit that's like one of like the major like downfalls of gamification so i don't i actually don't talk a ton about that because i actually think the like, games themselves have so much power for that it's why like something like ddr is much more powerful than assigning arbitrary points to something else but it is a nice it is a nice approach um for certain things but i so games like so moving moving out of undergrad i i, I started teach i i was on the six-year plan i changed my major my senior year i was a journalism major um, and I didn't want to do that. Uh, Brian Stelter, who was with the New York Times, uh, CNN, was in my news writing class. And I was like, oh, I am not good at this. <laughs> and I was like, I, I, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, so I actually, I, I changed my, and I had always worked with kids. I had always worked at camp. Um, and this is, I will, I will recommend right now, don't go into education just because you like working with kids. Um, but it just happened to be something that I was that I, I was good at. Um, and so I, I went into uh, education. I was a fourth and fifth grade teacher for a while. And games were an amazing way that I connected with my students. I would bring in my personal custom built PC tower and plug it into our monitor. And they'd play things like the newer version of SimCity and Minecraft. They would play during recess. And then that would turn into uh, my students using Minecraft in class, not the formal minecraft education edition that exists now but like they were bringing in their like amazon fire tablets that were running uh minecraft and they were building these amazing things uh when they finished their assignments for the day and then i realized you know what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna find ways for us to actually use this in the classroom so excuse me i started using things like minecraft to teach geometry right you can teach volume and area and perimeter using that i would use it in science i taught lessons on scarcity of resources i'd build like this huge bubble over a biome and i'd say you only have what's in here build what you need work with others and like they could basically replicate society within that bubble and as they started running out of things and this was fourth fourth and fifth graders having real conversations about scarcity of resources and why it's important to conserve and how you barter and trade and buy and sell from one another all within this little ecosystem and economy that existed on a janky server in my in my classroom um so that was when i like, games were actually i like it's funny because there was a period of time like i never thought of it as like games in education i just kind of did it and then I moved into central office. I started studying educational technology at Hopkins. And I I got bit by what we call the maker bug. Like I was really, really invested in, in, in maker learning, the idea that we learn through building, we learn through hands-on experiences. Um, we call it constructivism and constructionism. Um, and that's where the education, like my educational technology journey kind of took me. Um, so I ended up moving into central office for Baltimore County Public Schools and doing a lot of work around that we uh gutted an old school bus and turned it into a mobile makerspace that we took around to elementary schools um they had millions of lego pieces uh drones uh computers that you could code and program on 3d printer a cnc router and we would take this around to schools and and do stem steam lessons and then that brought me to where I work now, which is Digital Promise. We're a, uh, a global nonprofit uh, dedicated to closing the digital divide for our most marginalized learners, particularly those who have been historically and systemically excluded from from uh, opportunities uh, and did make or have been doing maker work there for quite some time. I've been there almost six years now, and we've really my work has kind of naturally moved back into this direction partially because i'm so passionate about it but also because of all the connections and like seeing games whether they're tabletop games or video games they are 
in and of themselves a media format and an industry. And when you when you've got something that's a media format and an industry, you can really teach and do anything and everything with it. So at its core, it's a way for us to connect with kids who are interested in games, whether they're video games, tabletop, D and D, card games, all of those things. But then, just like traditional sports, there's all of these career pathways that exist around it, right? Like you might be a football player, you might play D1 college football, and you don't, you still don't go to the NFL after that. So what do you do? There's so many, like you can go into broadcast, you can go into graphic design, you go into marketing, you can become an agent, you can do all of these things around this thing that you love. So why not be able to do that with games as well? And we we see that, you know, scholastic esports are are a big thing now, which is really amazing to see. You're really starting to see scholastic esports growing, particularly in the middle and high school levels, and definitely at collegiate, to the point where you're seeing scholarships being offered for some of these bigger games. So we've got a pipeline now where kids are playing. They should also be learning around this. Like Maybe I don't want to, or or maybe I don't want to play, but I love watching and analyzing gameplay. You know, you have uh, kids who will watch back their gameplay from when they were playing Fortnite or Rocket League or whatever it may be, and they do they do what they call VOD analysis, video on demand analysis. They watch back their gameplay and they critique it and they figure out where they went wrong. And so you're teaching all of these uh, analytical skills and critical thinking skills, and they can become coaches. They can go they can they can certainly play they might get a scholarship but they might find that they love talking about the game so they could start a podcast like this or they can um go work for an organization that that and do social social content for esports teams that are out there or for uh game publishers and developers so there, there's all of this opportunity in this space and it at, at its core it's just a way for folks to tap into the economy, into community, and to an an area that's just like it like I just I think about students who came come back to me over time and said like the fact that we played games in in my class was something that they didn't have again in their experience. And it was something formative for them that like we ha I have kids who have gone on and like they develop games. Uh whether it's professionally or just something that they're interested in. And that's really cool to see as well. Like, it's just like that that had that impact, that moment of connection that we had over something that we like um, carried forward with them and has informed what they do, which is always really, really cool to see. So, Nick, as I, I'm identifying in part with your professional journey, because I did something similar um, where my focus uh, educationally and and in career was uh, mental health field, psychology, counseling, but I brought in my love and skill set of drumming and found ways to integrate drumming um, as a school-based counselor in, in in a private practice in hospital settings and so on, similar to what, what you've been doing with gaming in the education system. And so as you're talking, I'm thinking back to my experiences, even still where I'm this outlier in the more typical system of this is how we educate or this is how we provide mental health services. And so I had to, you know, I'm very familiar at this point with, oh, this is a lot of the resistance or even if it isn't outright resistance, just like trepidation or, or uh, curiosity that the people around me, uh, colleagues, uh, people I work with, perhaps administrators, um, you know, I, I kind of know what to expect as far as these are the concerns or the questions or the curiosities they'll bring to the table. And here is my way that I've developed over time to um, to defend what what I still believe is a very valuable um, offering in that space. So I'm curious for you, Nick, because like my biggest thing was just drumming drum circles, like hippy dippy 60s, just getting high and whatever. Like that's very peripheral culturally where video games are not i mean video games is a and gaming more generally is a centerpiece of culture especially youth culture um maybe some of the older folks that that you came up with um professionally not so much for them because gaming i, I assume really mainstreamed with people around our age with uh with the first nintendo system so i'm curious for you nick 
what are some of these uh, concerns, curiosities that you're typically getting um, from, let's say, back when you were working in elementary school, like maybe some of uh, your colleagues at that time? And, and you're kind of starting to become identified, I'd assume, as, oh, Nick, he's flirting with like introducing video games to his classrooms. That's interesting. But were there concerns as well? Oh, ab absolutely. You know, video games are a, are a uh, controversial thing for a lot of people. I think so. Like, to your point about the drums, like maybe peripheral, but like I'd argue games are central in a lot of conversations we have, but they're not all good, right? Like you've got your Joe Lieberman saying like video games, Grand Theft Auto causes all of these probably, like, even though the research has shown time in and time again, that there's no, there's certainly no correlation. There is negligible causation. Um, and I'm sorry, flip that, reverse it. You know what I mean? Like, um, but you get a lot of that. You get a lot of like, well, it's violent. Well, not all games are violent. Okay, but that one's violent. Okay, but like, again, we, we assign blame to video games more than any other media format. So like, that's one that I, I've, I contend with pretty frequently. It's why I use the examples that I used earlier, right? If you're a reader, like you read, like games are a media format. Like if you look back over the history of time, Every new media format has garnered negative attention. Like we, we think back at like Orson Welles and War of the Worlds and like people actually thinking that we were under alien invasion. You go back and you actually look at the history of the printing press and the written word. And there are actual quotes from men during that time afraid of the uh, proliferation of fictional reading and women having access to it because it might distract them from their homely duties. Like talking about books and radio and television, obviously, and the internet, like we know all of these things, like new technology and new, new media formats are the boogeyman for lots of things. So like, that is something we always contend with. And the way that I contend with it is exactly what I'm doing now. It is a media format that is more interactive than anyone that has ever come before it. And that is a good thing. We can have agency for the first time ever in the media that we are consuming, not just like taking out creation, you there's agency in any sort of type of media creation, right? You can write, you can record, but games are the first media type, or like, unless you count choose your own adventure books, but even those were semi scripted, but also kind of a game um, that you actually have agency in how you engage with it, both whether or not you're creating something in Minecraft or you're playing through a story where you have a near infinite amount of choice. So the more I position it as a media format rather than just games as games, I, I, it starts, I start to be able to chip away at the arguments that you can't, that you, that you're talking about games as a monolith, like games. There are great games. There are terrible games. There are games that I think are a net positive contribution to society. There are games that I think are a net negative contribution to society. Same with how we engage with those games. There are games that have amazing communities around them. There are games that have insanely toxic communities around them, even though the game itself is fun. Um, so helping like the, the first step in this is helping people just realize that games are not a singularity. Like there's a lot of nuance to that conversation that you need to have. And there's an entry point for everyone, right? Like Grand Theft Auto may not be your thing. You can teach narrative structure with that you can teach the hero's journey or the anti-hero's journey you can teach so many you can teach how the physics engines work like there's so many things that you can do with a game like that that is so controversial but there's no there doesn't have to be it's just about how you how you frame it and how you engage with it those are the most important things why, why do you think um i mean so much of um game video games and gaming history is tied uh, to its marketing as a as a children's toy and it's really a development as a, as a children's toy um could that have been you know in hindsight been treated differently um as as something that might be as equally a, an educational tool versus what we largely consider to be just a pastime and a maybe a frivolous activity to some i i would go back to like 
do we do we get upset with people who I'm seeing the comment from from Steve Grows Weed in the uh, chat right now, and it's and it's like I can actually kind of address that with that. Um, I, I again, I think it's it's how. Ha- how are we framing it? And we need to frame it differently. So, so well, just, uh, just, uh, just to say the comment, Steve Grossweed says, I call gaming the ruination of men. Too many people get addicted and forget that there is an outside world. I think, so I think that anything can be addictive. Anything can be addictive. There are people on the internet that all day, all night, they discuss the, battle between AEW and WWE. That's what they do all day. They are whether or not they're actually in their basement, that is what they that is how they choose to spend their time all day every day, engaging in flame wars over two different wrestling federations that they actually have no stake in whatsoever. I always say to my wife like I stopped getting upset when the Ravens don't win because I'm not here to cheer for other people doing their jobs. Like I, I, I cheer for my team, but I don't, I don't cheat. I don't like, I need, I need to separate myself emotionally from that. So to Steve's point, games can be addictive and that needs to be addressed. Just like any other addictive behavior can occur. There are people who are addicted to reading. There are people who are addicted to watching television. The, all, all the, they, they binge watch the latest show, whether it's, uh, it's scripted or reality. There are, there are so many things that can be bad for folks. And games are one of those things, which is why I've got two young kids of my own. I've got my seven-year-old son. He's neurodivergent. He has, he's autistic and ADHD and my daughter, they both play games, whether it's on an iPad, my son plays on his switch all the time, but you know what else he does? He goes outside. He plays on his scooter. He wants to play with his friends. He wants to be with other people. Is it something that he does probably more than other kids do? Absolutely. Is it a hyperfixation for him? 100%. But there are times he knows that he can't play it, and we have that conversation. And But when he can, why should that not be his choice? If he's not being toxic, if he's not self-harming, if he's still exercising and going to school and doing well in school, he has friends. I don't care how much he plays. It's no different. Uh, it, it, it's people, sw- people will swipe on their phones while they've got Netflix on in the background and tell their kids to stop playing video games at the same time. Hmm. It happens all the time. I, I do it sometimes myself. And I'm like, no, like that's not fair for me. Like we need to have a conversation about this, but it's all about balance. Hmm. Um. I, I think framing video games as just maybe another medium is is a very powerful way of, of looking at it for me, um, because I think it's you're exactly right. It's no different than my addiction to television, probably when I was growing up. Um, and somehow that kind of ended up in a career yeah. for me. So, I mean, not exactly like, um, you know, bad, bad results. Um, but I guess going back to maybe my own uh, relationship with video games. What do you do when you recognize it is too much? You know, um, it, certainly my parents didn't really have that sort of education to limit me from uh, my experience with video games because they didn't really even know what it was about. You are of a generation that is clearly very much, you know, in tune with with what this is. How do you educate your children when you realize it's too much? I, I think you 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 hit the nail on the head with the first step is acknowledging there's a problem. It's like it is it is truly like any other addiction. If if somebody else is noticing it, you need to have some form of intervention if and and that sometimes involves and usually should involve a mental health professional. If you're noticing it yourself, I think the conversation is mom, dad, someone who cares about me. I'm having a problem with this. I'm noticing that I'm having an issue self-regulating. I'm spending too much time on this. I'm too focused on it. So if it's the person themselves noticing it, the first step is always asking for help. That addiction, it, it, we, I, I think, and and I don't I don't want to go too too deep into addiction, and I would certainly defer to to uh, Jordan in this regard. But like addiction, it's not it's usually not the vice itself. It's something else that is that is triggering 
addictive behaviors in somebody. They're trying to hide from something like that. We, we know that like so often there is something usually else going on that is causing somebody to demonstrate addictive behaviors. And the vice is, is their vice of choice often. Is, am I, does that sound right, Jordan? I don't want to, I don't want to misrepresent that. I'd say in general, especially if we're not talking about substance uh, use. Um, but yeah, it, I know people addicted to uh, buying shoes. I know people addicted to uh, playing certain games. I know people addicted to, um, uh, and to be clear, these aren't clients. These are just people in my personal sure. life. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, the, like lifestyle type behaviors um, that oftentimes uh, turn into some uh, sort of compulsive behavior because yes, underneath that, there's usually something there. Um, if that's not tended to, then maybe, okay, we can wean you off of um, feeling this um, compulsion to buy another pair of shoes, but then maybe the the addiction or obsession just goes to something else because the core issue has not been addressed. Yeah. So so that right there, I like I if if the addiction is truly, I'm addicted to games, then then there there especially now, there there are there are mental health professionals that deal with that specifically. They deal with addiction and deal deal with gaming addiction itself. Um, and if that's a problematic behavior for you, then it might be a thing that you can't do. Like that is. Uh, that is very much a thing. Like people can't watch certain television shows because they're triggering for them. They can't read. There's a reason why trigger warnings are on things like this is again, if we go back to it as, as this is a media format and I will, and I will say it is a media format that has feature sets and tools that other media formats don't have that are, that are designed to give you that dopamine hit and keep you playing. So like that is something like that is very, and like, there are also folks in the gaming industry that work to combat that. that like I, I see somebody in the comments mentioning microtransact microtransactions. The idea that like you buy the game, but then that or it may be a free to play game, but then you spend a lot of money trying to level up your character, getting access to things that you wouldn't have had access before, and that can be a troubling behavior. And and, and games are designed, and it's why you're starting to see legislation around things like loot boxes. Like they're, they need to advertise the, what the actual odds are of getting the thing that you want, because it is in effect, it is, that's actually like, you're probably more addicted to gambling in that sense than you are to the game because it's the high of unlocking that thing. That's really it, same with Pokemon cards, same with, with any trading card game, anything that has really manufactured scarcity can can be turned into something that's an addictive gambling behavior. Um, so games do have the potential to be more addicting than other media formats, but you you would never throw out any other media format because of that. You just make sure that the legislation around it and the supports around it are as such that we're not we're specifically not targeting minors and that there is a way to engage that you don't need to do those things like i can turn off microtransactions i can turn off my son's ability to buy a, a full retail game or things within a game like it, there's so many resources that are out there now whether like already built into a, a gaming platform a console or a pc or resources out there that like you can figure out how to make sure that these things are in place like you can set time limits for how long you can play or how long a, a child that's under your care can play. And like, I would say with that, certainly set those limitations, have to have discussions about what healthy boundaries are. Everybody is different. Every kid is different. Every adult is different. But then the most important work around that is the conversation that goes along with this. Not just I'm arbitrarily limiting you to 60 minutes of video games a day. Mm -hmm. Sure. You can do that. Are you helping that person understand why like so much of so much of why we engage in behaviors or decide not to engage in behaviors comes from understanding the value add or value detraction there so like i'm limiting your time on this game to 60 minutes because i see your grade slipping i'm limiting my own time playing games because i recognize that i'm not sleeping enough at night and i've got a family i've got to take care of and a, a job i have to show up for like 
I do that for myself. And if I'm having trouble regulating that my, myself, whether it's that or or binging the newest season. Oh, and the Love is Blind came all out at one time. But like, whatever it may be, like, hmm. bad use of time is bad use of time. If it's bad because of the amount of time, then I need to address that. If it's bad because of the toxicity in that community, then that needs to be addressed as well. I saw someone in the chat like, I turn off chat. I hate playing multiplayer games with people I don't know. I don't mind if they're on the other side and I can't hear them. Some people love that proximity chat. They love the banter. They love being super racist. Like, all, like those are all things that happen in online games. So, like, I'm not here to say that those things don't happen. But there are controls you can put in place to limit exposure to those things. And there are conversations that can and should be had with people who are still developing well into their 20s as adults. Um how you can engage in these spaces safely and engage with this media format uh, differently than than you do with other formats, but in a way that can still bring you a lot of enjoyment and joy and, and really positive growth. I, I think so much of this conversation uh, for me is illuminating the importance of being educated about video games, especially if it's something that, you know, your children are inevitably going to be exposed to and will probably really, really get into. Like the idea of like even the concept of, of these uh, micro microtransactions and the fact that I could even do anything to control is something I have no knowledge about. Mm -hmm. So um, I and I wonder how many parents who just simply let their, you know, kids play video games thinking it's not, you know, as innocent as a, a, a as a Nintendo was back when they were younger. Yeah how much they realize um, it's evolved and how much they could even control. So I, I, I mean, to me, it just tells me how important it is to just kind of educate ourselves on what the state of current video games uh, are right now. And that's a lot of work, right? Like there are organizations, like the Common Sense Media is amazing. Um, uh, the ESRB does a really great job. There are so many resources out there, but wait, what you just said is, is spot on. When you, when you had an, the original Nintendo, you bought it, you brought it home. It had two connections to the outside world. Or no, one connection to the outside world. The power plug. That was it. You, you got power from somewhere else. The rest of it was kept in your house. You, you plugged it into the television. You plugged the controllers into the Nintendo. You put a cartridge in the console. What you got was what you got. And you didn't have to worry about other things. You knew the game you bought. You didn't have to worry about people hacking in, spending extra money in the game. Like you, you knew more. The games were simple at that point, so like you really weren't running a super high risk of coming across something that was like really ridiculously inappropriate. Like it was a, a pretty contained experience. Now, I, I, I don't fault anybody who looks at games and says. God, that's scary. You hear you hear about like grooming online. You hear all these awful sort like racist comments in multiplayer games. Like you hear all of these things. And it's no wonder parents don't want their kids to engage in it. But you can engage with games in a way that like like you can you can be as in the broader game community as you want, or you can play a really I like I, I say isolated like I, I I mean and I don't mean that in a way that like you're isolating yourself from society but like you can I mean and that is a problem and I and I think we've already talked about that but you can play it in a way that's really just very self-contained like I can I can still find a game that is a single player game that I don't have to engage with others if I don't want to and if I want to play something multiplayer I don't have to listen to them talk if I don't want to I can leave the game as soon as that's a problem if it becomes a problem but I can also say I don't want to hear other people's voices and and if that game isn't an option for me like if 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 like if talking with people that you don't know is is something that is really like critical to the gameplay. I'll be honest. A lot of times I don't play those games. Like I'm as much of a game fan as I am. I've never touched league of legends because I know how toxic that community can be. I, and, and I, there's a lot of wonder pe wonderful people who play that game and a lot of good that comes out of that game. But there are people who are awful in that community. And it's just something I don't want to risk. Say even I play, uh, you know, I play Fortnite pretty regularly and Fortnite has that too. I don't, load up with random people i play with my other dad friends that i know or my kids 
or I play by myself and I play multiplayer, obviously, but like they can't hear me and I can't hear them. And that's just what I'm more comfortable with. I, I prefer that gaming experience and that's the one I stick to. And that's another thing for folks to remember is like, you can curate your experience with this media format, just like you do with anything else. You don't want to watch 24 hour cable news. You don't have to. Can I just commend Nick and say that, you know, I think it's really refreshing that you're not just here as a complete apologist for video games to say it's all oh. good. There's no, you know, there's no risks. There's no issues. But I would like to just mention that from a transatlantic uh, perspective, the what I suppose what you might call the um, Grand Theft Auto thing is something that more I observe across the pond in that. Uh, and I don't want to get political particularly, but I'm going to have to sort of skirt on the issue oh, here boy. is that it. I, I can observe that video games and particularly ones where you're killing people and so on, you know, as part of the gameplay are scapegoated for real life violent events um, school shootings and so on. Um, that doesn't happen in the UK and Ireland. And, uh, and I don't think it's a coincidence that, you know, guns are not freely available in the UK and, our, and, our, and Ireland. So I don't want to get into a political or, uh, you know, issue about the Second Amendment or anything like that. All I'm saying is that, yes, there are certainly people who don't particularly like aspects of the gameplay, but, you know, we don't have that public discourse here because largely the, the, the events that the game gets blamed for um, don't happen very often. But I was just like it's these games are played all over the world. They're played all over the world. There's one country where this happens more than anything else, any other place. And like that right there tells you a lot of what you need to know. It is it is absolutely a scapegoat. Like I said, there have been countless studies on the impact of violent games and violent tendencies. And actually, a lot of the really interesting research is on violent games as a treatment for folks who are suffering from PTSD and have suffered violent trauma in the past. It is a way in a safe space. It's similar like when you like you see people go to these uh, rage rooms now. They just go in and they just break shit because it's cathartic, but it's not hurting anybody. They are they are fake characters on a screen and there is no emotional attachment to that. And I understand that the argument that like, well, if there's no emotional attachment, eventually you live in that space. Barring severe mental illness that people are already having trouble delineating between the real world and fictional worlds. You're, you're not seeing that cross over into the real world. I'm not running up and down the highway crashing my car into people because I've done it in video games for 25 years. It just doesn't, it, that's not, it's not a thing. It's been debunked time and time again. Um, and it is absolutely a scapegoat. And again, that doesn't mean that I think that seven-year-olds should be playing Grand Theft Auto. And I appreciate the, the kudos. Like media formats are a net neutral. It's how we use them that can impact society one way or the other. They are a net neutral, even violent games. They are a net neutral. What you do with them after the fact is something different. It's, it's, you can use media for good and bad, whether you're creating that media or you're taking that media in, you're consuming it. It can have negative and positive effects just like any other media format can. Like pro wrestling, when we're watching people use like actual glass and fire to uh create the 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 fiction of of harm on one another it seems like you know um i mean i i kind of feel bad that we're um kind of spending so much time talking about the negatives of, of video gaming and, and and we're kind of putting nick in a position where he kind of has to defend it mm -hmm. but i i i it comes across to me the reason why you're so passionate about you know th this topic is because you see so much the benefits of video gaming that maybe others uh, like myself might are it's not um you know a, as evident yet and i do want to spend some time talking about it but we do have some callers on the line that i want to get to um to see what what they have to say about the conversation um so let's just start things off here with andrew who's been very waiting very patiently in his vehicle hi andrew how are you yeah. doing hey andrew hey i'm doing good i just uh 
my floor's getting done back at my house, so uh, I got a little uh, plug for uh, I'm gonna move this out of the way. Plug for uh, underneath my flooring there. Okay. Uh, what what is your uh you know what do you have to say about this conversation? What's your own history with video games, Andrew? Um, I'm kind of like a lot of you guys, where uh, my first was the NES. Uh, I like to play like the original Mario's, but I was also really into Mega Man Three. And uh, one of the things with that is I learned because I have a little brother as well, and uh, so he would try to play the second controller. And what I learned was if you manipulate the second controller, you can actually manipulate the gameplay itself. And it's almost like a little cheat device. So, for example, like Mega Man can just flow through the air over all the enemies and all the pits if you uh, screw around with the second controller. Wow. I love that. Didn't know that. Did you, I, 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 I learned this one just a few years ago. Uh, second play, You plug a second player controller in... To duck hunt, I know I talked about duck hunt before. You can control the duck. Oh, I never knew you can plug in controller two and player two could control the duck. The duck hunt is a two player game. I mean, I think loosely, uh, I think it was like, but yeah, you could you could plug in a second controller and you could control the duck's movement around the screen. So, okay. yeah, it's and wild. Uh, any other thoughts on on any of the things we've discussed so far, Andrew? Like it's it's funny. Like the I don't play many violent. I, I I'm a big Nintendo Switch guy. Nice. Like I mostly play. I I collect video games. Like back at my house, like it's it's something. Like it's really great. Like I had a flood recently, oh, uh, cool. it, which happened after the what's the uh, up next uh, Christmas party. Like basically after I left after the stream ended. In the 12 hour period, my basement flooded. Oh. And uh, one thing I want to talk about, like, it's not really talked about as much as the uh, the sturdiness of a lot of the older consoles because my basement flooded twice. Uh, my NES was submerged, Super Nintendo, uh, Nintendo 64, and Genesis, they all work fine even after being underwater. So that's always fun. But that reminds me of. Um... And I, I'll, I'm, I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna send you the link in just a minute. Mm -hmm. um, it was on display at uh, the New York, um, the New York Nintendo store uh, up until recently, but they just removed it. But they had a a working Game Boy that survived the Gulf War. Like, really? literally, literally survived a bomb during the Gulf War. Damn. And it was on display, and like it worked. It still worked, and. Uh, it still works. It looks like you can see if you scroll down a little bit, you can see it running Tetris on it. It's completely charred, um, but it has Tetris running on it. So, yeah, they don't they don't make them like they used to. Um, but I mean, it, it's 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 funny, like so many folks from our generation, like there's always a gaming story. There's always like part of their formative experience was playing games and a lot of folks move away from it. And I, I get into a lot of conversations with other dads in the local community and they're like, you still play? I'm like, I play all the time. Like I'd rather play a game than watch a TV show. Like I like to be actively engaged in what I'm doing or building something in a game. And that's no, no shade to anybody who doesn't want to do that. I also plenty of times just want to sit down and just put something on the TV and just let it play for hours. That's okay too. Like, but it, it's amazing. Like you, you do, you see like all of like folks who just, who get away from it from one reason or the other. And it just so had, like, I, I kept finding my way back to it and, and seeing how many other folks have never strayed from it or like have found their way back to it or discovering it for the first time um, is just really, really, we live in a really interesting time that it's still, much closer to the infancy of gaming uh, than it is to it being like an established media form. But you're, you're really starting to see more and more folks treat it as such that it is like, it, it is a media form that like we, we need to be able to engage with it in the same way that we engage with others. Like misinformation can come from video games, hmm. whether it's the game itself or people spreading mis and dis disinformation through the voice channels and the and the discord servers that are that are around games so gaming isn't going to go anywhere so whether or not you have a positive or a negative view of it i think one thing we can all come together around is that 
it deserves our attention and it deserves us spending the time figuring out how it fits in our world. Yeah. Um, just quickly here, we do have a number of calls to get to. So, Andrew, I'm going to drop you off on the line unless you have uh, something really that you want to get off your chest right now. No, no, no. It's just like, I'm just like, I, I do play, like, the only, like, I, like, yeah, I hear a lot about competitive games. The only competitive game I play is Pokemon. Like, I play, like, online, VGC. That's, like, the best way to describe that is, like, it's chess, but all the pieces are different. And all the individual pieces can be different from each individual piece. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's really, like, it's very complicated stuff, but it's always really fun to try. And plus, like, my only other video game thing is I got the oh, uh, nice. Legend of Zelda tattoo of Triforce on my hand. I love, that. I love that. Cool. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks Andrew. Andrew. Yeah. Jordan, did you have a thought you wanted to finish, uh, complete? Very briefly, looking at that uh, Game Boy reminded me a few months ago, I, social media algorithms were serving me all these videos of um, professionals restoring consoles like this, like taking them apart, cleaning them up, uh, reassembling them. I found just watching those videos to be like very calming, very interesting, but it helped me really appreciate the artistry of, of what it takes and the skill set to, to, to service a, a console like that. And in a lot of the people that I work with, especially when they're imagining, um, future career and trying to figure out maybe how to improve their quality of life based on the way that they make money in career. I, I think it's important to realize that, yes, we're talking about gaming. And so most of our relationship to that is playing playing the game. But as Nick alluded to earlier, um, like there's, there's an entire industry around these things, no different than way you've uh, built a career um, within pro wrestling. Uh, but with your own skill set, the own ways that you can add value to it. And I think that's really important to, to talk about and normalize. Um, a, a, an example I'll often use is, okay, if, is your profession, uh, your profession may be, I'm a custodian. This is what I do. Okay, well, what do you also love uh, just in general culturally? Well, if someone says, I love uh, football, okay, well, there's plenty of football facilities or there's some football facilities that need custodians instead of just applying your trade anywhere uh, we can start thinking about uh trying to inch toward north stars that are more interesting to us bringing the skills that we have from a career perspective um so yes if if your skill set is is marketing and you're really into uh let's say uh, politics okay like move closer to that. And and I guess what I'm trying to express is that the things that we're most naturally drawn to, especially as younger people, and, and like those things typically like light us up, they give us a good energy. Um, I believe um, with full conviction, there are ways that we can continue engaging in those cultures uh, around those interests, um, even if with pro wrestling, if we're not the pro wrestler. For me, I had some marketing and communication skills, and that was a way that I was able to contribute and make some money in the field of pro wrestling. And I think most of us, there's probably some sort of connection between what am I good at and what do I like? And I would like those types of conversations to be a bit more normalized. And I credit someone like Nick uh, bringing more attention to these types of conversations for those in which gaming resonates with them. Nick just sent along a list of um, uh, gaming professions, and uh, it seems pretty dozens and dozens. Yes, mm -hmm. and yeah. and one of the things I like, and it doesn't matter what trajectory it is. Like this is just this is a talking point, and it's an entry point into conversations around like what people want to do with their lives, and it may be they 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 have dreams of working in the gaming industry, but like the gaming industry is hurting a little bit right now, like record profits, but also record layoffs. I mean, there's a whole other conversation to have around the the dichotomy of those two things. But I'm, I'm thinking like, you know, we just at Digital Promise, we just launched what we call a spotlight school in Anaheim, California. And we we put a learning studio into this space and it's in partnership with HP, Microsoft and Intel. And we, we they got 13 really high powered machines, podcasting equipment, uh, 
DSLR cameras, broadcast switchers, all this amazing stuff given to the school along with professional learning. And the work that we're doing is all around student interests and tapping into those for career and technical pathways. And a lot of this is what we're talking about is you're interested in games, but maybe you're, you're not, you're not going to be a professional gamer or esports athlete. And that's okay. Like that's still very much like a, a growing part of the industry. But like you look at this and like, there's a ton of it jobs. There's cybersecurity. So you can learn about cybersecurity from the lens of like, we want to, we want to learn about anti-cheat software because that like, I play a competitive game and I want to learn more about how the anti-cheat software works. Well, like that's great. And maybe you'll work for a gaming company that that's the job that you do, but maybe you're bitten by this bug that like you love gaming. You were interested in the anti-cheat software, but now you've started taking classes in cybersecurity. And now you're in one of the hottest fields in the world and can be making high six figures doing cybersecurity work. And it all started with your passion in gaming. You're not necessarily working in the gaming industry, but it was your entry point to it because you found it interesting. You wanted to, you built video games using Scratch, uh, which is uh, a, a very simple block-based uh, programming language out of MIT. And you designed your own characters for that. And all of a sudden now you've realized that you know how to do 2D animation. And maybe you want to do that in the gaming industry, great. Or maybe now you can go work for a marketing firm and you are one of the lead animators for any of the animations that they do. And you're not working in the gaming industry, but you've got a really solid career trajectory and you found something else that you love through something that you love. Um, there, there's the, the opportunities and like gaming is the one that I talk about most frequently now, but this is really any, any interest. I'm interested in this thing. Jordan, you said it. I'm interested in pro wrestling. These are the skill sets that I have. How can I use those talents in that field? How can I then take what I did in that field and parlay that back into another field and, and, and doing that work there or moving up in that industry? It, it's all like we can take our interests and and turn them into any opportunity that we want. Let's continue here with some of these calls. Let's go up next to Corey. Corey, welcome to the wall. Hey Corey. guys, greetings from uh, the uh, JFK airport uh, 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 flight lounge. I'm flying to Japan right now, so I'm uh, talking to you on oh, wow. uh, shitty uh, airport Wi-Fi. Mecca have, video uh, gaming. Yeah, yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> um, so. You know, I, I I could go into my history with games like I, it's ebbed and flowed like most people. I think uh, in my teenage years is when I was both at, at my most engaged and my least engaged. Um, I think when I discovered greater music subculture and getting more involved in that, I kind of strayed away from games. And in college, like that that extended out there. I think it was after college when I kind of landed myself a bit more of a steady job. I started reincorporating video games back into my life and I, I went fairly deep in on video games you know I, uh, I you know I read articles like and not just you know in the sort of like consumer electronics like this is good this is bad kind of way like real like think PC journalism you know your uh, your polygons your waypoints now aftermaths of the world you know doing real journalism about you know video game industry like standards and conditions for workers and uh, you know, greater cultural writing around it. So I'd like to think that I'm a, I'm, I'm deep in on this, whether I want to be or not. Yeah. Um, and, and for me, uh, I, I've, as I've gotten older and I've had to like balance a lot of priorities in my life, just going back to like an earlier conversation about self-discipline. I mean, like I have to discipline myself with how much, how much like video gaming I can do. I have a job I have to maintain. I have to work out. Uh, I have like real world relationships that I want to maintain. I, I can't like no life, uh, you know, final fantasy these days, you know, I just, I just can't, it's not, uh, it's not 1997. It's not even like 2000, like 13, you know, uh, I, 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 but, and I think that that's, that's the case with everything though, right. You know, spending time on the internet, buying, you know, clothing or whatever, it's all just a matter of self-discipline, which I think is a core tenant of parenting. And I think it all goes back to, you know, 
you know, your Jack Thompson's and Joseph Lieberman's of the world, you know, kind of, you know, scapegoating uh, video games as this pariah of greater social decay. It's like, no, it, it, it starts in, in the home. You yeah. know, it starts with family. Um, but I'm also riding on a big high right now. So uh, I'm, I'm going to actually uh, kind of go into, you know, waxing a little more poetic about video games. So I just beat a game last night. I beat the game Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, nice. which is the continued remake of the game Final Fantasy VII for 1997. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go into talking about kind of a major... Uh, so, so I don't know if either of you three are familiar with the sort of lofty reputation that Final Fantasy VII has. Some might consider it uh, one of the greatest games ever made. It has what a lot of people consider one of the most iconic scenes in video games. It's, the, it's, it's straight up up there with Luke, I am your father, and, uh, you know, Rosebud was the sled. Uh, in... In the game Final Fantasy VII from 1997, I'm going to spoil a major scene for like a video game that came out more than like 15 years ago. Um, a major character that you you have gotten to know throughout the game in your party dies. You can't bring them back to life. Just in this scene, they get unceremoniously cut down, and you watch them die, and you hold them in your arms. Uh, that is a core gaming memory for a whole generation of people. We have gotten to a point in games where games can start to examine their own legacy in the history of its own medium. And I think that's very interesting. This game, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, very much is aware of the fact that you know that this girl is going to die. And it reckons with that in a lot of very interesting ways. And I'm not going to go into how it does. I'm not even going to go into if I like it or not. But the fact of the matter is that we're at this point in the history of the medium, a very young medium, where it's able to reckon with its greater cultural significance uh, with a whole generation of people is very, very interesting. And I think it, it shows just how much it has matured over the course of its very, very, like, relatively short existence. I think pro wrestling does that all the time, doesn't it? You mm -hmm. know, as we're drawing, you know, similarities. I mean, when you see somebody go for a wrestling move um, that's, um, you know, like, uh, you know, related to... Um, Anytime somebody, you know, Kenny Omega goes for like a styles clash or something, you you kind of understand the implication. Or anytime any, any wrestler goes for a sharpshooter, you understand the implication, even though that wrestler may have never shared a ring with Bret Hart before. Um, th this is, you know, the medium sort of like referencing to its own fan base, uh, sort of like touchstones, you know, from its own history. Um, any thoughts on uh, what, what uh, Corey just had to say, Nick? Yeah, I mean, it... it it is the sign of a, of a maturing media format. Uh, and Corey, I think you hit the nail right on the head with that one. Um, and, but it's one that's still, it's, it's simultaneously mainstream and niche. Like mm -hmm. people, like there, there is a huge contingent of like people who get that and can understand that reference and understand like the importance of these, re these, uh, they're not re-releases, they're remake, like they're full on remakes of Final Fantasy VII. And there are a lot of people who understand like how big of a deal that is. If I said that to my wife, she'd be like, I don't know what, I have no idea what you're talking about. It is still in like, but like she catches Game of Thrones references when Game of Thrones was really big. Like it's, it, it is still, it is part of the mainstream, but also like alongside the mainstream in a lot of ways. And like people move in and out of that. Um, it's it's really it's really fascinating to watch, but I think that as Corey said, like we're moving more and more in a direction where like these things are like every every Grand Theft Auto more it, it's more and more in the popular culture. Like people recognize it more and more. Minecraft has been like I think they're celebrating their 15th anniversary coming up. Like Minecraft, like you, it's hard to go onto YouTube no matter what your algorithm is and not come across a Minecraft video at some point. And like not everybody engages with it to that degree, but I think that you're starting to see more and more people recognize it. And while it is still, from my perspective, very much a, a net neutral people are co-opting that and turning it into what they will.
Like you have people who will praise Minecraft as like as their saving grace. And then you will have people who will say like this is something that has taken my child's attention for far too long and distracted them from other things. And like there are conversations to be had about both of those sides of that. But at the same time, recognizing that the fact that there are different conversations to be had takes you back to the fact that it is it is itself a neutral and how it's being used or how it's being used to create or how people are consuming it is where things start to go great or not as great yeah and i'm, I'm always a fan of whenever a medium it becomes aware of itself becomes aware that it is a thing that exists in a greater cultural contest this final fantasy 7 rebirth is aware that there's a whole generation of people that have a core memory of this one mm -hmm. scene happening and it's sort of hinges itself upon not just the scene itself this reference to the scene but the its awareness of people being aware of it mm -hmm. it is it, it's it's very much a sort of meta text of uh of its own legacy and i think that's very interesting and the fact that and it's not the only game that does that you know you know 2013 spec ops the line which is very much a uh examination of violent video games in that uh it is a game that forces you to do unspeakable acts and then makes you look at the unspeakable things you've done uh you know we've come along there's a there, it, i'm gonna leave you with this uh the biggest cliche that you can ever say when it comes to uh games is uh we've come a long way since pac-man uh but let me tell you we've come a long way since pac-man have a good one, guys. See you, Thank Jerry. You, Corey. Thanks, Corey. <laughs> Thank you, Corey. Have a good flight. Uh, we have a limited time here with Nick, so let's try to get through some of these calls uh, while we still can here. Let's go up next to Muggin. Hey, well, welcome, Muggin. This wellness policy was made for me. Nice. Welcome. Super Nintendo Sega Genesis. When I was dead broke, man, I couldn't picture this. <laughs> Little biggie. I had to. I had to. And I also had to, I also had to wear this, if you could see it, uh, Nick. Oh my gosh, I love that. Yeah, right, we're so really going for Final Fantasy today. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, yes. I mean, you know, video games has been a passion of mine since, 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 for, since for, for as long as I can remember. I mean, I mean, I started off, I started off with the Super I started off with the NES and the Super and the Super Nintendo and then moved on to Genesis and then and then the N64 and then I've been a PlayStation guy from from the majority of my life. Yeah. M Muggin, how how would you say that throughout life, um, and even now in adulthood, gaming has has been a positive influence for you? In a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, is in a lot of ways, it's my a lot of in a lot of ways. You know, gaming is my source of comfort. In a lot of ways, it's my source of comfort. No matter how tough life gotten for me, I've always had that to turn to. And um, you know, in addition to in addition to that, I mean. So in addition, I've grown from childhood to, to my to now. I'm 33, and I, seeing how the industry has changed during that during that during that lifetime during my lifetime has been quite a joy to watch. And uh, in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways too. I mean, it's um, it's a source of comfort, but also it's also good for the brain because I know a lot of the common misconception of like you know video games will rot your brain, which is complete BS. Because as we get older, like our brains will change. As we get older, our brains will change. And video games are a great way to like improve our neuroplasticity because it allows our brains to like you know create new pathways so that way we can access our cognitive functions better. You know, our memory, our attention span is going to get sharper. Our memory is going to get better. You and dropped this link in the chat, um, Muggin, about neuro. Uh, uh, it looks like a, a neuroplasticity. neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity in video games. Um, what what exactly you know can we gain from this sort of um, research, or have I you mean, gained? Well, I mean, from what I understand, I mean, from what I understand, I mean, like you know, retirement homes have, um, have from what I understand, like recently, like retirement homes have, like you know, gaming stations that allows the people who suffer from strokes, you know, from you know, who suffer from strokes, the chance to like you know relearn their cognitive, relearn their motor functioning through video games. So it allows them to like you know, it's it's also it's a good recovery tool. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry from Samry so much because I'm so passionate. <laughs> Uh, no, you're fine, and, and you're 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 absolutely right on those things. So, Jordan, you you referenced it a little bit earlier, like that, like there was that gap. There was a certain point where 
controlling all of the different things on the controller was like you, like you didn't know which buttons to use like that is that in itself is is learning like uh so my son i mentioned him before um he's gotten occupational therapy for the last few years i think one of the number one reasons why he quote unquote gradu graduated out of occupational therapy and handwriting and all of those things is because of how much he strengthened his fine motor control and a lot of that has been through playing video games he plays He's been playing Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, which has it's not a it's not a super complex control scheme, but there's enough there that like for that age, like he has it has it has it's clear to me that he can do more. And like I could then have conversations with his occupational therapist saying like he can do certain things this way. So how do we help him translate that from this to here? And same with his uh his reading ability too. Like so like you had like the physical his physical well being and, and growth and learning, but also like you know, he didn't want to learn how to read. He had no interest in learning how to read whatsoever. Um he's now an incredibly fluent reader and he practiced in school obviously and like this is like a, a ton of thanks goes to the team around him at his school that supports him. But like a lot of it also came from me say he'd ask me what's going on in the game and I like I know you can read this. I will help you with the hard words. Stop skipping through it. You don't know what to do now. Maybe you should talk to that character and read to me what they're saying. And his fluency grew leaps and bounds. Wow. And then we can have conversations about the game because it's forcing him to slow down and read. And he will now read other books because he got over that fluency struggle that he was having. And now he doesn't struggle with it as much, which has opened up the door to him reading longer texts. So like, I absolutely credit that game with with him and his growth cool and um and, sp and speaking of which i heard you saying it was on the spectrum i just yep. want to tell you nick that i'm on the spectrum too yeah and it, it's, it was definitely like you know reading came a little later for me came a little later in life, came a little later as a kid and i was i was learning big words too at, at a young age absolutely and i can definitely relate to that and, and uh, how it, many hours how many hours did he get on breath of the wild I'm oh my god he's in the hundreds now it's wild but he um <laughs> he it, it's a like not not just that but any game in any media format like it's been something that he's been able to look to and find positive ways that he can take what he learns from those games and apply them in real conversation in ways that he engages with others like he sees those models and we have conversations about what what are good and bad ways to act so like you can learn from these things without having them influence how you positively or negatively engage in the world but they can be talking points and things to learn like teaching tools without in like forcing behaviors that i think that people somehow attribute to to this uh format and um lately um lately i mean video games have come so far as a medium that uh, it, it it offers it, it also it also portrays you know things you know like mental health very mm -hmm. very 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 accurately for example, Hellblade, Sinew and Sinew Sacrifice is a great example. I mean, it's, I mean, the sound design, I mean, the, the way it approaches mental health and psychosis is so authentic because, and the sound design is a great, the sound design is just so stellar in that it captures the characters, you know, the characters' inner, inner turmoil in their head. Because we're playing that game with headphones. Playing the game with headphones was, it was, was scary because I felt like for the entire time I was in that game, I felt like I was in her head. I felt like I was in her head, hearing her thoughts. And it was just it, it. It's a great example. It's a great tool. To, it's a great tool to use to, sh to showcase, you know, mental health. Absolutely, and depict mental health. Thank you very much, Muggin. Appreciate the call. We're gonna have to get the show moving because Nick actually has to get going here. Uh, we are uh, at the the one thirty mark here. Um, Nick, thank you so much for spending your time here with us talking about this topic. We certainly wouldn't be able to do this show without you. So, if people want to learn more about you and everything that you do. Where can they go? Uh, Twitter, X, whatever it is, is probably the easiest one at Stay Playing Nick uh, on Instagram as well. You can also find me on LinkedIn, uh, Nick Shiner. I think I have Stay Playing Nick in there as well. So you could find me, uh, find me there. But I'm always happy to talk about these things. We didn't even really get to, I, I wanted, I had this whole thing lined up. We, I wanted to talk about like games uh, and like how wrestlers use them on the road, like up, up, down, down, all of that stuff. Like, the the road is a the road is a hard thing. I travel for work, and I can only imagine uh, that the impact on wrestlers as they go day in and day out, and seeing that they use games as a way to connect with one another and with folks uh, out in the world is is really cool to see. So that's my last little connection there. But 
anytime you guys want to talk about this stuff, I'm happy to do it. Thank you, Nick. Right, and Nick, Nick, you'll you'll be you're going to WrestleMania. I am. I'll be there both nights. Okay. Are you guys so, gonna uh, be there? We'll uh, we're all we'll there. be in Philly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Phil, uh, stadium adjacent. Something like that. All right. Well, text me, and we could we should all grab a drink. Or Sounds a great, man. Some Thanks right. again, Nick. Appreciate Thanks you, brother. Thanks, Nick. Right. Thank Bye, you. Guys. Take care. Take care. We do have a few more phone calls here that we might uh, just kind of finish up just to kind of let some of our audience uh, get a word in here on the topic. And let's go up next. Um, it looks like we are going to the uh, Arctic here with uh, Aram. Where are you, Aram? <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm at the uh, ski resort in yeah, north man. of Sweden. Wow. Beautiful. Yeah. So I feel really bad because Aram has been standing outside this whole time waiting to get on. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. D don't worry. Don't worry. Uh, yeah, we spoke about games. Like, uh, yeah, I used to play a lot of video games when I was younger, but now as I get older, I feel like Neil a bit. I just play it to like uh, calm down after work. Mm. Um, I specifically only play sports simulators. I have a, I don't, you, I don't, I can't, I don't understand these games, these new games with shooting and too much color in it. I feel like a. Yeah. No. <laughs> no, no, I feel no, like Fortnite. Old do we stand? Yeah, yeah. I, that's why I make fun of Neil. That's because I feel like him. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. Yeah. And Aram, I, 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 I under, I even undersold my age when I talked about the NES. I go back to, I remember an, an Atari system in our house. So, um, and my older brother had it, but that's a 1970s thing. So, okay. So, so Aram, I mean, how how old is your son at this point? Um, my son is nine years old, and uh, I use the I use uh, like he plays a lot. He plays like Fortnite, and he plays too much for me. And it was like interesting to hear Nick how he, how he challenges his kid to like make a good thing about it. But yeah, uh, like I I have a troubled time. Like the only thing I'm concerned about is him going on to the toxic community, the online community when he plays. Mm. I don't want to play it. Make I, I can let him play online, but I don't want him to be because uh, to be able to see these uh, messages and comments and speak with all the kids because like even when I play uh, the the football simulator, I get. Uh, different like each week and you are some and it's probably like 10 year old kids threatening me so you know i you know i can take but i can't imagine what small children would feel like um, so how do you what do you do to um i guess try to limit that well on, on playstation you can turn it off sometimes it just turn it on just to see like how many threats i get and i was like oh you know yeah they should see who they are t talking to you know <laughs> but 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 I, but with him, I'm just, I'm like holding him like I can let him play, but he has to like turn it off. Uh, he can play with his friends that I know, you know, yeah. but uh, in a sober tone. Uh, so it it's work, work, works out fine. And, and I do connect with my kid playing. Mm. But, you know, it's always the, the line, fine line when I want to let him play to like, relax and loosen off it just can take over everything else like homework and you know, sport activities and everything mm. else so it's it's a balance you have to manage all all the time mm. thank you so much for your thoughts aram thank you appreciate Bye, it Neil. enjoy the rest of your holiday aram enjoy the slope i will i will i will yeah let's see if i can break your leg <laughs> uh, let's, let's hope not thank don't you get color. See you, bud. Yeah. yeah don't get color too much color uh let's go up next to Br hansi hey hansi what's up what's going on man uh enjoy the show um uh i got i'll, I'll try to be as quick as possible but uh, i used to uh enjoy video games as a kid and then uh um and it's, it's funny because uh, the first time I saw I saw someone get addicted to video games was my dad when uh, he stayed up all night playing Mike Tyson's Punch Out. He wouldn't let any of my friends play, kind of in a way, because like he tried to beat Mike Tyson, and uh, I was like, "Yo, dude, this is like you know, this, this is a primitive game. This isn't like one of these complicated games you see now, whatever." I kind of feel like uh, I'm left out with that shit because uh, I didn't know. Vi I thought video games were gonna like stay primitive. I didn't know they're gonna get so advanced. 
So I, I the reason why I gave up on them is because every time that like as a kid or growing up that I, I play with my friends, if I beat them at something, they would get so pissed off at me. So then I would just have to dumb myself down by not uh by not like being as good but whatever. Because like I don't know, I just I, I didn't want to have an unpleasant evening rather than you know uh you know, what I mean? it just—it's like, oh my god, these people are getting obsessed with video games in that regard. So maybe I—I I, I wasn't around the best people to play. Uh, like, there was one guy I know that this happened at my house, but this is before even going online to play video games. He lost to the computer, and he said he he said an anger, um, he has such an anger issue that he took the PlayStation, he threw it outside of the road, and then he said he lit it on fire, and then he let a car run over it or something like that. Like that's how insane. Some of these people were with it. So I was like, yo, I don't want to play video game with these kind of people. You know what I mean? I don't want, you know what I mean? I, I, I would reduce people from coming to my house. Uh, there was one time when my uh, when I was a little kid and I wanted to play the WrestleMania game um, that was on Nintendo, right? That one that everyone plays. And my sisters wanted to play Super Mario. So my mother had to tell, my mother had to tell me that um, in order to play Super Mario, she goes, uh, you, you know, the, the, the little brown Koopas, whatever. The little brown little uh, people that you Mario smashes on. He goes, those are Andre the Giant's kids. And uh, if you smash on enough of them, Andre the Giant will appear. And that was her selling point to let my sisters play. And then I'm sitting there waiting for like hours and hours to like, when's Andre the Giant going to show up and all that type of stuff. Like the, 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 those are some of the good memories I, I had. It was pretty funny, whatever, and all that. I, I had decent um, moments playing video games, but I, I kind of wish I, I, I've been kind of waiting for it to go into like the three, like the, uh, the virtual effect where I can go into the video game where I want to start, uh, uh, where I want to start, uh, you know, going in, the, in that direction. I thought maybe I could start fresh from that, but I don't know if we'll, uh, if we'll ever fully get into that. But uh, I, I, I do miss that, like, you know, um, like not knowing much about video games and all that kind of stuff, because I, I like how they've become more advanced. They've actually become learning tools and all that. I can recognize the good and all that, but just me growing up with them, you know, I, I saw bad with it. And, you know what I mean? A lot, a lot of bad things came out of people from playing video games. So that's why it always kind of scared me off of playing video games. That makes sense. Mm. I, I I share maybe some of, some of those same fears and, and concerns and i think the conversation with, with nick was healthy because um i guess it it, it 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 reminded me that um we shouldn't like maybe the fear just simply comes from a lack of um education about what it actually is and and um by only maybe focusing on the bad parts we're really going to be missing out on a lot of the good and and there's so much of it that for me i'm interested in simply because of um culture like there's so many references um, and I think so many important things about video games that are affecting just our daily lives in the way that like a popular movie might or, um, you know, a popular uh, musical artist that I would love to be a part of the conversation with. So do you guys, uh, Neil or Jordan, have any recommendations for maybe um, how Hansi could maybe tip his foot in without maybe some of that concern? I think it's very personal in a way. I mean, I, I, when when Jordan brought up um, phone and mobile games, I, I sort of remembered just all of a sudden, I spend at least half an hour every day playing Plants vs. Zombies 2 on my iPad. Um, and, um, you know, it's completely harmless, you know, and it does have microtransactions, but it's just one of those um, tower defense games. You've got to stop the zombies reaching the house with the, an array of plants that will stop them. <laughs> And, and I love that, you know, so, I mean, it's probably made for seven year olds, but it's the sort of thing I enjoy. And then um, Nintendo, I always think is still, you know, um, games that you can, anyone from kids to- No, she w you. And... Yeah. And, and um, even, in fact, a fairly recent game is Super Mario Wonder, which is just a new take on the Super Mario World games that you're talking about, Hansi, well, the one with the Goombas and the, the Koopas and all of that, they're all there. It's and it's a 2D platform game, it just looks a lot nicer these days, you know. But, um, let, let me ask you guys a question before I, before I go. Did you guys know that, uh, you know, that Super Mario 2, Super Mario 2 that came out back in the 80s? Yeah, did, did you guys know that that wasn't the original Super Mario 2 and the original Super Mario 2 was like Super Mario 1? But it was too hard, so they only kept it. I, I saw a video on that, and I was yeah. fascinated. I'm like, oh my god! Because I, I remember not liking Super Mario Two. I'm like, this is so 
un- this is so out of the ordinary from what I was used to in Super Mario mm-hmm. 1 that I saw this whole video about Super Mario 2. Did you guys ever, were you guys ever familiar with that or no? I watched the video in the past year as well. Maybe we watched the same thing. It was pretty in depth, like a, an hour long uh, video on YouTube about the history of all that. See, I liked Mario 2, but I remember feeling like this was completely different. And 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 from memory, I, I don't I don't remember the details, but I think essentially Mario 2 already existed as a game. They just swapped out uh, the characters essentially. So that's why it has more of that, like the desert vibe and um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, just a very different world. And then Mario 3 felt completely different from 2 as well. Um, but yeah, from memory, I think Mario 2 already existed as a game that was successful in another part of the world. Um, and and they just swapped out the the familiar Nintendo IP with that game. Okay, and, and just one more thing, one more thing. Uh, because you got, because you're into video games, can you explain this whole like? Uh, and I'll take it call. I'll take this off the air. Um, because I'm noticing it's coming back now. Whatever. I missed out on the first one. So apparently, there's a thing called GamerGate that took place, and then all of us. And then it was a big. So thing. let me let me just stop you. We're we're not re- really into video games. I, I suppose if we're oh, comparing okay, okay, sort okay. of notes here, you know, Nick would have been the, the authority to speak on it. But yeah, I, 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 should, I should have asked him because because now there's a reboot of GamerGate coming out this time, and people, you know, because again, if if you actually want to count video games, I know this doesn't really count as a video game, but social be, being on social media is kind of like a video game because it's like who you're gonna, it's like a, it's like Final fantasy essentially who you're going to interact with will you get boosted up from these interactions and all that kind of stuff so in a way like without me mm-hmm. even playing video games these are like kind of in a way final fantasy like you know video game like life in general could be considered a video game if that makes sense you know what i mean you're constantly like you you don't know what you're dealing with essentially and you don't know what's gonna make you more prosperous or make you go down back to the bottom if that makes sense but i'll leave you guys with that thanks for taking my call man peace out Thank you, Thanks, Hansi. Hansi. Let's go up next. Uh, lastly, here to New Jersey for our final call of the show. Brandon, how are you? Is this is this thing on? Can you hear me? Uh, you might be muted or he might be asleep. I can't tell at this point. Um, go, go, okay. I don't think we're going to hear from Brandon today. So, uh, very <laughs> climactic end to this edition of the Wellness Policy. I had a lot of fun, guys. Jordan, thank you for introducing the topic. Mm. Uh, any any last words from either of you? I'm curious as the the father of the group way. Um, you know, Oscar is is not even two yet, but is this something that that has been on your mind or conversations between mm-hmm. you and Pauline in some sort of way of like? And I'm sure no different than uh, the iPad, or no different than. Uh, internet at some point for 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 oscar like i'm just curious how you are conceptualizing introducing gaming and and thinking about uh, limits and and the ways that you want to be a part of that journey with him i'm definitely thinking about it already um we are you know like we are definitely limiting just screen time in general for him at this point i mean some parents don't even allow any screen time at this age for uh, you know a toddler um, but like at most we might give him like 15 minutes, you know, watching like an educational video on YouTube or something. I've given him the iPad just to kind of play with like a drawing app, just to kind of introduce him to, you know, colors and just even the concept of like putting a stylus to, to a screen. Um, so at that, this is sort of the level we're dealing with right now is just simply even knowing what's going on. But as he gets older, I know he's going to be very, very obsessed with, you know, all the other, what, what all his friends are going to be playing with. And, um, for that reason, I I kind of look forward in a way to maybe learning about it with him just so that I can at least, you know, feel responsible in uh, curating his experience. Um, but then it's going to get to a point I know where things are going to be exceeding way beyond my comprehension. And, um, you know, at that point, I I don't even know what, what how I would do it. You know, would, would I be able to keep up with it um, in a way that I could control or uh, do I just kind of trust that, you know, by that point he would understand what's going on? That's sort of the way my parents handled, handled it with me. I mean, they, they never picked up a, a video game controller. Um, all they did was just, you know, tell me to not play so much. And, mm, 
can can you know it, can we go a bit further than that you know like nick was sort of suggesting can we go beyond just simply telling a kid not to play so much and give them a reason about why it's not it's important to not play so much and you know just maybe offer a, a different level of understanding and, and analysis yeah and what i really appreciated about nick was not only is he relating to his son from the perspective of like creating guardrails and trying to be just wholly protective but finding and just like what he did as an educator finding the opportunities for expansion uh, for learning for development that the gaming is already presenting to his son mm -hmm. um neil any thoughts not really, although I'm kind, I'm kind of inspired to really try to get to grips with the two joystick mechanic. I think I got it in me, so that's going to be my uh, self goal. You're going to try to uh, take on the, the, the demo of uh, Miles Morales, <laughs> yeah. Spider Man? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Spider Man. Okay. Uh, okay, let's try this one more time because this person has re entered the room. Brandon, are you there? I'm here, man. I'm sorry about that. Can you hear me? All good. Thank yep. you for your patience. Oh, uh, no, I apologize. Um, no, I'm on the road. Uh, uh, the, the the guest was talking about the road being a cruel mistress. And uh, I, I, I have to drive, like, literally close to an hour away for one freaking case to, for a fucking delivery. So, uh, <laughs> Goodness. but I'm all right. Um, uh, you were talking about addiction with uh, with some games. Like, uh, a mobile game I used to have, uh, Simpsons Tapped Out. Like, I, I love that game so much. Like, I think I must have spent, like, close to, like, five racks on that game like it was so addictive like i would just buy like every like freaking character or like whatever it was it was it it got to it got, it got to the point where i was like i'm spending all this money on on this game i'm not having fun with it anymore. it's getting redundant so uh i i instead of like going to rehab i just like quit quit on the game <laughs> i deleted the app i was like <laughs> i was like if I, if I go into this game by ea ea's like taking money from me so i couldn't do it anyways it was it was insane yeah like my, my siblings uh chide me on that to this day they were like oh man you bought the freaking uh that donut shop for you for like close to 100 bucks you're an idiot i was like oh, yeah you're right I, I, with hindsight I shouldn't have done that. I should have spent my money more wisely. But uh, yeah, it it was that uh, the addiction is real for for certain games and whatnot. So I just and, wanted to share that. I appreciate you sharing that, and I think it's important to realize that many games like this are specifically designed to create that consumer behavior, and it uh, no different than uh, social media is designed to maintain and capture our attention. Um, apologize if you hear the construction outside. Uh, I. I, I used to play Candy Crush a bunch. Now I play this uh, King's Nightmare game. And like, I spend a significant amount of time, like last night watching Raw, I'm also playing this game. Uh, it was one of those things that I had to commit myself to at the beginning. If I'm going to play these games, I am not going to spend a penny or anything more to get five extra lives to beat that level that I've been stuck on for the past five days. So as, and and I can feel the the pool. Well, it's only 99 cents and I've been fucking stuck on this level for nearly a week. Like it's only a buck just to move on. But I see that as a potential slippery slope that I am not interested in um, getting involved with. But it takes a certain amount of self-awareness and discipline, which is a word that we've mentioned many times in this conversation. Um, it's a commitment to myself. And the younger we are, hopefully there are parents involved um, or, or others that can engage with uh, whomever they're responsible for to simply ask about the games that they play and what they're like for a, a guardian or parent to have enough curiosity to understand these are experiences uh, my child is having and realizing that uh, they may be susceptible or vulnerable or, or inexperienced and that could lead sometimes to um, negative consequences. Word up, man! Appreciate the canter. Uh, well, I, I like, like, <laughs> like, um, like I, I, what well, Hansi was talking about where people rage quitting. Uh, and I'll be brief. I, I remember I was playing a buddy of mine in a in a I, I think it was Ken Griffey baseball or something like that, and I kept on throwing him cutters, like and and the sliders and all speed pitches, and he kept oh, striking out. Game. 
Yeah, and he, he was like, he was like, what, why? He was like, throw me a fastball. I was like, no, I want to win. And so I kept on throwing him all speed stuff, and he struck out finally, and he got his remote, and he chucked the remote. He's like, throw a fucking fastball. He threw the remote and he <laughs> broke the remote and he rage quit. And I and and I, that, that 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 happens. It's crazy. Uh, and uh, that I just wanted to share that with with, with you guys because uh, because I love you guys and I appreciate what you do. And I, I remember falling I remember falling asleep one time playing two K uh, hoops with Eric Marcotte too one time too. That was funny too. More than one time, probably rather than if you're honest. Yeah, you, you you know the vibes, Neil. You know the I vibes. Do. Uh, all right guys uh love you all can't wait to see you guys in the flush yes. there is there is there's an e-gamer arena in the in, where the wells fargo center is at it, near philly live by the way they, they built that a couple years ago okay. right near the philly okay. right near the philly live casino that uh neil loves neil, neil loves games. <laughs> yeah. you'll That's have to show gaming. us Lovely. neil loves the penny slots man all right guys i love you guys love it <laughs> thank too, you brandon thing. see you next week uh, and, and see you two next week. We will be all in yes. town for Philadelphia and WrestleMania weekend. Uh, so if you see either myself, Neil Flanagan, or Jordan Goodman on the streets of Philadelphia running around in our um, um, you know, gray hoodies um, to Bill Conti, do say hi. Uh, guys, we, um, we have ideas for topics for next month, but although maybe we, we want to kind of marinate on it before announcing it, but um, we will be back. Uh, until then, any thoughts or last words from either of you? Not really. Just take care, everybody. Anyone who's coming to Philly, yeah. Um, All right. Take care. <laughs> take care. Bye-bye. See you next time here. Bye.